Well, good evening, everyone. We're just about right on the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started and be respectful of everyone's time. Um, welcome to the Fellows webinar this evening. Uh, the topic is radiology of the acetabulum. My name is Steve Cherney. I'm at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. I'm really excited to be joined by our co-faculty today. Joined by Will Reisman from uh, Chattanooga. He did a Carolinas fellowship and uh, John Eastman, who's at the University of Texas in Houston uh, out of a, a shock fellow, or sorry, excuse me, a, um, a Harborview fellowship. And then uh, I uh, did my training in Houston as well. A um, couple of uh, things to take care of first in terms of the disclosures, uh, they've, they're listed here. Um, as far as we can, we've limited the, uh, the um, Conflicts of interest, and this is an educational program. Uh, this is an AO North America event, and uh, as much as we can, we've tried to reduce uh, again any biases and uh, again keep it to the educational content that's relevant to you as a learner. Just uh, some Zoom etiquette. I think y'all should be familiar at this point, but all your microphones are going to be muted. Your videos are turned off. If you do have questions, we really appreciate those. Keep those coming in. Till we. Uh, done through the Q&A session. If you can, the chat functionality is for the faculty. Um, but as we go along, we're gonna try and keep everyone uh, uh, engaged if we can. Anytime that questions come up, please go ahead and use that Q&A function and we'll answer those as we go along if we can. For the learning objectives for this evening, we'd like you to be able to identify the cardinal lines of AV pelvis radiographs in terms of identifying acetabular fractures. We'd then like you to be able to apply the late turnout classification and then so, select the best surgical approaches for these fractures. We'll move on to advanced imaging by examining CT scans, identify the fracture lines that are relevant to you as the treating surgeon, and then any associated soft tissue injuries, and then finalize your planning with the 3D reconstructions. Um, and we'll go over all this this evening. For the schedule for this evening, uh, we're in the middle of the introductions right now. We're gonna move on to a rapid fire quiz. We'll spend about five minutes doing that. We'll review the answers at the end of the session. We'll then talk about radiograph basics, a very quick chalk talk, we'll spend about five minutes on that. We'll then focus on three case presentations. Each of the faculty will have a case presentation that we'll go over. And then at the very end, we'll review our rapid fire questions and uh, see how we did. So this is the first rapid fire quiz case. This is an AP pelvis. We're looking at the left tip here. Here's your AP pelvis. Here's your Judeo obliques. And then the question to you is, we'd like for you to identify and classify this fracture according to Lake Trinnell. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds or so. Question number two, here's your presenting AP pelvis radiograph. Here are the Judeo obliques. Case number three, here's the AP pelvis. Here's the oblique views. And then get all three together. <clears throat> All right, this is case four, AP pelvis. This is a little bit clearer image, hopefully, without the binder in place. Here's the obliques. Here's all three. All right, and we'll bring it on home with case five, AP pelvis, the oblique views, and all three together. Great. All right, we're gonna move on. Thanks, Mackenzie, for running those uh, questions by us. We're gonna move on to the anatomy and the radiology basics. So I don't wanna belabor this too much, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least review the, uh, the background and the osteology and, and how that relates to the radiographs that we're supposed to be talking about tonight. So 
Let's remember that the hemipelvis is made primarily up of three bones and development, the ileomysium and the pubis that all fuse around the acetabulum. And Judea and Lake Chanel, a little over 50 years ago, they introduced the two column theory uh, and that's relevant in, in how we uh, approach and describe these fractures. Uh, the anterior column and the posterior column uh, join up at the acetabulum uh, for the support of the, the hip socket itself. Remember the anterior column runs from the iliac crest down to the symphysis pubis. There are three different segments in the anterior column, the iliac segment, the acetabular segment, and then the pubic segment. In the posterior column, as you imagine, it's a posterior structure. It extends from the greater side of notch down to the inferior portion of the ischium. Now for our standard radiographic evaluation, we're gonna have three primary modalities. We'll start off with our screening AP pelvis. Um, most uh, places and, mo and most treating surgeons will then obtain Jude oblique views, and that consists of the iliac oblique and the obturator obliques. And then it's become commonplace for patients to get a CT scan. Uh, and at the trauma center that you're at, you may have a scan that's with or without contrast. But this is a standard radiographic evaluation for pretty much any patient that has an acetabular fracture. Remember the cardinal lines for, uh, as described by Jude and Lake Chanel, when you're assessing for uh, the hip socket itself, you start off with uh, this green line outlines the posterior rim, the anterior rim in this peach line here, the weight-bearing dome or the acetabular roof in yellow, the teardrop or the it's sort of the quadrilateral surface and the, the inner surface of the acetabulum. The ileoischial line outlined here in red, and the iliopectineal line here outlined in blue. Remember the Judeo obliques, it's a 45 degree roll. You're not bending the beam, you're actually moving the patient to get these views. And remember, if you're going to obtain these views yourself, uh, you need to make sure that the coccyx, if you're going to judge the appropriateness of the, the films, you want to have the coccyx center of the ipsilateral femoral head. Here's a view, uh, view of the iliac oblique here. Uh, again, outlined in red, this is the, the greater sciatic notch down to the ischial spine. Uh, this denotes the posterior column here outlined in red. The anterior wall, again, is this peach color here, uh, the anterior rim, if you will. The opposite is true for the obturator oblique. This is good for looking at the anterior column along this uh, pelvic brim here. And then you can see the posterior wall outlined here in green. Moving on to the CT scan, I really think that it's helpful to look at soft tissue windows or P protocol windows um, prior to looking at uh, any bone uh, windows, if you will. I think that the soft tissue or PEED protocol windows give you a lot of extra information, a little bit better contrast between the different types of tissues that you're looking at. Uh, as you can see in this cross section, uh, a little bit higher up in the abdomen, you get a lot of information of other injuries and other things that are going on with these patients. Uh, you may see air if it's an open injury, you can see any other abdominal injuries. Uh, in this patient, you can see a huge ventral hernia. Uh, uh, hematomas are fairly easy to pick up when you're looking at the soft tissue windows. And then especially if it's a contrasted scan, you can get a pretty good idea of what the patient's vessels are looking like. Obviously, we're here for the bones. We're intending to fix these fractures. So the CT scans also provide a wealth of information regarding the bony injuries as well. You can see the major fracture lines. You can see intraarticular loose fragments, any impacted fragments, how much comminution there is, where the femoral head is sitting. Uh, is the head dislocated? Is there any associated lesion on the femoral head, which might be relevant to that patient's prognosis? And then is the joint congruent? And then finally, you also look at the, uh, the, the structures of the remainder of the pelvic ring, the SI joints and the, the remainder of the posterior pelvis. 3D reconstructions have really become popular in the last 10 to 15 years as well. And they're, they're great for surgical planning, but I think that these are one of the last things that you should be looking at, uh, but they are incredibly helpful when you're uh, developing your preoperative plan. On the left, this is an example of a surface rendered image. Uh, these are great for surgical planning. They give you an idea of the, uh, what you're gonna be looking at during your surgical approach. They can show you what windows you're gonna be working in, where the clamps are gonna be placed uh, as you're working in the operating room and where your implants might be placed as well. On the right side, this is an example of a volume rendered image. I think that these are actually really important to look at also. Um, and uh, hopefully your, your PAC system is able to, to do this sort of assessment. Uh, because this is actually going to correlate really well with what you're seeing in the operating room. And that's why we're talking about the plane radiographs and the Jude radiographs and these volume rendered images is because the reality is that when you're treating these patients in the operating room, 
you're going to be looking at a C-arm spot rather than uh, you know, a 3D surface rendered image, you're gonna be looking at a two-dimensional image and you need to be able to correlate that with what the patient's injuries actually are uh, in, in three dimensions. Remember now we're gonna try and fit these patients into the late genetic classification. So remember there's 10 different uh, described acetabular fracture types. The elementary here on the left, they have fracture planes that are uh, simplistic and run in a single plane. And the associated types, they have fractures that are running in multiple different planes. Now, is the late genetic classification still relevant? I think that it is. Uh, certainly, there are times when there are fractures that don't fit quite well. There are transitional fracture types, but in general, it still is very helpful to allow for cons consistent communication between team members. I think that most of the time, uh, if you can classify the fracture appropriately, you'll know what approach you're going to need to be making. Um, and there are some exceptions to that, but by and large, if you get the, the fracture classification right, you're going to know your surgical approach. Uh, and then it's also helpful for documentation and research purposes. Now, this, this is a little bit of a busy slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Will Reisman now, who's gonna take us through our first case, but this, this sort of a chart can help us work our way through um, as we try to classify these fractures, um, but there are sort of these algorithms that can kind of help us work through uh, and make the appropriate diagnosis. So I'll turn it over to Will. Thanks, Will. Yeah, so thanks, Stephen. This is, um algorithm that was given to me by my mentor, Steve Sims. Um, it looks like a really busy slide, but really it boils down to basically five questions. And, you know, if you, it, what it does is it helps you start to pick out the things that are most important for you to figure out what's going on with that fracture. And so as we walk through this first case, I want to walk you through this algorithm so they can kind of show you um, how it can help you take what you're seeing as a two-dimensional image and start to, to assimilate in your brain so that now you're starting to get this three-dimensional idea of what's going on a little bit. So the first question here is real simple. It's like, do you have the iliopectineal or the ilioischial line that are disrupted? So is the anterior column or the posterior column disrupted? Yes or no, right? The second question is, do you have one or two of these columns broken, right? As you can see, you're starting to separate these into kind of groups and you're starting to narrow them down. The third question comes out is, is the ischial ramus broken? Now, when you first think about it, it's like, why does it really matter if the ischial ramus is broken? Well, it may be the difference between a, a transverse or a T-type, all right? And so as you start to ask these questions, it starts to help you kind of put things in categories. So after, is the ischial ramus broken? The, the next question, um, that you ask is, is there a posterior wall component, okay? Um, and then after that, the next question is, does it involve the ilium? So is the iliac wing broken, all right? And that's gonna help you start to, to narrow this down. Um, and then there's a last thing kind of thrown in there, is there a spur sign? And that's a, a thing that we'll kind of get to in just a second. So let's, let's just kind of uh, walk through this first group of, um, uh, or first case, and try to go through this so you can start to see how this is working for us. All right, um, it does not want to change. There we go. Um, so this is your typical vignette for, um, uh, there's definitely a big delay on that. I'm trying to get it to go back. Anyway, the typical vignette is a um, middle age to late to elderly guy in his 60s, he falls from his bicycle, he has some hip pain, he can't walk, they bring him into your ER. Uh, sometimes even the initial AP radiograph looks negative. Um, uh, but here are the obliques. We'll see the uh, AP here in a second, I show it again. Uh, but here are the uh, oblique views, your obturator oblique and your uh, ili iliac oblique. Um, and I'm I'm assuming I have control, but I don't know. All right, um, Stephen, why don't you take back control since it's going, there it goes. Okay, so um, here's the AP pelvis. So I, I want you to start thinking about um, what um, this looks like and what um, type of fracture this might be and start to formulate in your head what you think it is. All right, as I go to the next slide, 
There we go. All right. The question, the first question that I'm going to ask is, are the iliopectineal and or the ilioischial lines disrupted? Well, on that AP radiograph, you know something is disrupted, right? But I couldn't really tell you, is it the iliopectineal, is it the ilioischial, or is it both? Um, and so when we really want to look at those lines, we go back to our due day views, your obturator oblique and your iliac oblique. So those are the ones we're going to look at first. All right, so here they are. Um, so as we look at our obturator oblique, we get a good look at what? It's our anterior column. All right, all right. so um, is that broken? Well, yeah, it looks broken. On the iliac oblique, we get a good look at our, um, our posterior column. And as you can see here, those are where those fracture lines are. So we know, yes, the columns are broken, and yes, it is two. So we really just answered our first two questions in this algorithm, right? So we've already decided that it can only be a transverse, it can only, or a transverse posterior wall, a T-type, uh, both column, or an anterior column, posterior hemi T. Those are the only five that it can now be. All right, based on the answers that we've just figured out from our three radiographs. All right, so um, now what's the next question there? Well, I'm going to go back. The next question is, is the ischial ramus fractured? Okay, and so here we are. Is the ischial ramus fractured? The answer to that is, yeah, it is. It's right down there. It's kind of subtle, but the obturator ring is broken. And so the obturator ring, it being broken, is a big indicator of, of kind of what's kind of going on with that fracture. So I want you to always think about paying attention to that when you're trying to figure out and classify these fractures. All right. So the answer is yes. So now we're over here on the, it can either be a T-type uh, associated both columns or an anterior column posterior hemi T. Those are the only three things that can be with both columns broken um, and the ischial ramus broken. All right, so the next question as we go down this algorithm is, does the fracture involve the ilium? All right, so what's the best views to look at the ilium? Well, you don't want to look at the obturator oblique because it doesn't show you the iliac wing. So either the AP pelvis or the iliac oblique, the iliac oblique being the best view to kind of show you the ilium. And as you look here, and we're trying to move on to the next slide. Um, it is broken. You can see that clearly both on the AP and on the iliac oblique. All right, there we go. And there are the uh, arrows. All right. So um, now as we go back to our algorithm and we say yes. So now we've already decided, is it an associated both column or is it a posterior, anterior column, posterior hemi, hemi T? Well, um, here is where the obturator oblique really helps us out. If you remember what is associated with a associated both column, it's that spur sign. It's the medialization of the joint away from the ilium where the joint is not connected to the ilium and this SI joint at all, right? So that medialization shows you a spur sign. So when you look at an obturator oblique, if it's gonna be a both column, you'll see a spur sign. Do we see a spur sign here? The answer to that is no, we do not. So this has to be an anterior column posterior hemi T, all right? So let's just go back and talk about that stable segment. If part of the acetabulum is still attached to the ilium and the SI joint, all right, then that you typically won't get the medialization of the joint because the capsule is still attached to the head and you don't get that medialization and you don't get that significant displacement that you see with an associated both column, all right? Uh, and that's why a lot of times these fractures don't show up uh, very clearly on just an AP radiograph. Uh, and so you don't, it, they oftentimes get missed in the ED because it's a low energy fracture fall on the side of a hip from a bicycle or a ladder or something like that. Right. So here you can see that stable, intact articular fragment. Now, if that fracture plane came across above the acetabulum, you would have a uh, free floating joint that can medialize and you would see that spur sign, all right? So this is an anterior column, posterior hemi-transverse fracture, and now we know, based on Letronel, how are we going to approach that? We know that this is best approach through an anterior approach, all right? And there's a myriad of ways in which you can try to stabilize that. This is a stereotypical uh, ilio-inguinal approach um, that was done. 
with stabilization along the anterior column as well as along the iliac wing uh, and a screw down into the posterior column into the ischial uh, segment, all right? Uh, so hopefully that was uh, informative to kind of show you how that algorithm can help you think about the key points that, um, that make you start to understand how these fractures work. Great, thanks, Will. Appreciate it. Um, unless there's any questions, we'll keep moving on. Um, we'll talk about uh, case discussion two. This is one of my own cases. This is, uh, in full disclosure, this is actually um, case number seven from part two of my board. So also happened to be one of the first couple of acetabulums that I did. So um, I guess we'll get rolling. So this is the presenting radiograph. He's a, a 77 or a 70 cell year old uh, patient who uh, was in a, a motor vehicle accident. Um, he had this uh, acetabular fracture. We're not going to pay too much attention to the uh, anterior pelvic ring injury. We're just going to focus on his left hip socket at this point. Here's his dislocated film, and then he gets reduced in the emergency department, and uh, here's our films. Um, just throw it out to the other faculty real quick. Uh, John, I don't know if you have any thoughts about uh, what you see here, if anything jumps out at you um, so far. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great example and it builds off the rapid fire and then which is Will kind of nicely lined out. I mean, I think my eyes, again, we're going to ignore everything else. I know we have a sequence of how to look at the whole pelvis and try to clue in on, on a lot of other things. But if we look just at the left acetabulum, you can see that, again, the iliopectineal and the ilioshial lines are both disrupted. And so for me, that's already down into the, the second and third stages of that algorithm. And then for me, it just kind of quickly goes to, is it a columnar pattern? or is it a uh, transverse family pattern? You see the posture wall in the back. And so again, for typical patterns, for me, I'm already thinking a, a transverse family pattern because I see no columnar extension up into the crest uh, or to the wing. Um, and it's pretty atypical to have a, a columnar pattern with that fracture pattern or displacement of the posterior wall. And so I'm already going down the algorithm trying to, in my own mind of how I've kind of set up those thoughts to now I'm thinking it's, probably a transverse posterior wall because I don't see a clear cut break in the issue of ramus. But I think that um, sometimes um, I think we all are aware it can be kind of sneaky. It can be out the ischium. It can be a very low uh, or a small posterior column component of a T, uh, maybe an anterior column. But uh, again, I'm thinking this is a transverse posterior wall from the start. Yeah, I, yeah, think and, and I would just add in real quick. I would say that a lot of times it is sneaky and we're not looking at the best view to really look at that operator ring. Um, and, and the other thing is there are some variants out there. And if, if the fellows haven't sat down and really read Letronel's book, all the variants that are, could possibly be out there are described in that book. And so there's crack, there are things that go down through the ischium um, that typically that might be classified as something else. And so there are variants and things out there, but that's maybe not quite the best view to, to see that. So. Yeah, it's really incredible to read that book because uh, you think that you may have seen something new and it's really not new at all. They've recognized this, you know, 50 plus years ago. Um, so th these are these are the best that I can do for Judeo obliques. Um, I, I stopped getting Judeo obliques pretty early on. Um, I, I still think that it's incredibly helpful to know what the views are because we need them in the OR for fixing the fractures. And I'll still look at these uh, volume rendered images, but um, we, we were having such trouble getting the text to shoot good quality films. Uh, and there was a lot of contrast in the bladder that tended to be in the way. Uh, I went away from getting them pretty early on. And uh, I think you need to work through that on your own. I don't know if uh, Will or John, you have any comments on that, but it's just sort of a, a personal thing. I think you need to work through um, as you learn how to approach these on your own. Um, but uh, Will, do you have any other comments? These are sort of your, your Judeo bleak views. Uh, yeah. I would say that um, Judeas are, uh, my institution, we couldn't get them. We did the, you know, tilt the beam instead of, you know, roll the patient up. And, and they were, they just were worthless types of images, but we didn't have the ability to do ghost images. So it was kind of the worst of both worlds. And, and to comment on your board experience, my board experience, I only had an AP radiograph because that's all I had. And I had an acetabular guy just tear me apart for that one. But then he said, is it really that bad there? And I said, yeah, I guess it is. But um, anyway, so as I look at this here, you know, I, um, I, I can clearly see that the ilio ischial line is disrupted. The ilio pectineal line is disrupted. Um, 
I can see what appears to be a uh, goal sign. So posterior wall component. So again, I'm thinking, you know, this is probably like a transverse posterior wall, you know, that I'm looking at here. I, I yeah. can't, I don't see the, the issue of ramus on this um, uh, operator oblique. So yeah, no, perfect. Hey, Steve, one comment I think about for the Judays, I mean, again, I think like you mentioned, it's very dependent on the institution. And even in when you do have the technology, just like everything, I, I think it's very tech dependent. I mean, there are some people who are in it and they're gonna give you a good quality. And I have some great images that kind of look like claymations. I mean, it's they're kind of worthless, but I think sometimes we don't get them so much more for these patterns, but I think for some of the uh, less displaced transverse patterns, you wanna see if there's any instability. And so it's almost like a stress view. When you put them on that hip, it may unveil uh, some kind of occult instability that may push you down a different treatment algorithm for that patient as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's a really good point. It is a bit of a stress view. It's also a stress view for the patient that has an unstable acetabular fracture and can be kind of a tortured uh, device for them too. Um, but anyhow, that's that's a, another bit of a personal uh, issue that I have. Anyhow, so I, I moved on to the axial cuts again. This is the, the scan that you saw earlier. This guy had a huge ventral hernia. Um, so thankfully I didn't have to make any big anterior approaches, but it was something that I found to be relevant on his, uh, imaging, especially when I'll take care of his, uh, anterior pelvic ring injury. Um, no SI joint injury that I could pick up on, uh, and then getting down to the axial cuts. I like to go through the axial cuts first. I don't know if you guys have anything different, uh, but again, all this is speaking towards this being a, you know, transverse plus posterior wall sort of, uh, injury pattern. He's got a pretty sizable fragment in the joint. Uh, as he was reduced, he pulled that fragment back in. Um, I go to the coronals next and the sagittal last. Again, it's a pretty simple pattern in the front. Uh, the radiologists are measuring the joint fragment for me. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, and then there's you know a, a bit of impaction uh, out the posterior column where the, the posterior uh, exit point was. Um, again, surface rendered images are, are up next for me usually. I, again, I find them to be really helpful to sort of visualize uh, your your windows and where your clamps are going to go, and then your uh, what you're going to actually see in the OR. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about this really high posterior exit point uh, of the posterior column. Um, you know, it tends to be seen in, in certain patterns. I don't know if you've had bad stories or what, um, but uh, you know, for me, this this was a bad story. Well, don't don't mean to you know give up the ghost too early, but. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll, you'll show it pretty nicely, but I think any time, any sort of fracture pattern, and again, the columnar patterns get back in there. I mean, we know what lives there. Um, it's the neurovascular bundle and the superior gluteal, and I think you're going to cover it and we'll maybe beat a dead horse. But I think knowing that it's there, and oftentimes, I think a lot of times we're seeing that in the 3D surface rendered, you can't actually see where the bundle is. Sometimes it's hard with the hematoma to trace it on a good CT angio that may be uh, done in the in the ER but you're going to be aware of that bundle that's there and I think we've had a couple come through recently um, where Dr. Rouse he's actually kind of he's he's taking a rangeur because he can't mobilize the bundle out of the fracture to get it reduced and so he'll kind of take the tip off that way it can get the the full reduction without jeopardizing that vessel so yeah. um, I think I'm always nervous when I see fracture patterns getting high um, and back up into the notch there. Yeah. yeah, and especially if there's a gapping, um, I can I can say that I learned from uh, Dr. Kellum, you know, that uh, if you see a big gapping that remains gapped and doesn't ever seem to reduce uh, with traction, um, there's likely something in there. And I've seen the sciatic nerve actually end up sliding in between the uh, posterior column and the ilium there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so... He, that was actually a non-CTA uh, image that got repeated at our institution. And uh, he had actually been seen at an outside facility first, got a CTA, and then transferred in for a higher level of care. Um, when I looked at his scans, I didn't go through my usual algorithm. I got a little bit off kilter. I only looked at the bone windows. And that's one of the reasons. This, is, this guy is the reason why I look at um, you know, all windows on every patient, all views sort of a deal. Uh, because this is your bone window. You can see that displaced segment of the, the transverse. And you think the stuff in the middle here, you know, maybe that's bone, whatever. Uh, but it's a little bit more obvious when he's got that contrast and you're looking at the soft tissue windowing that uh, that's a pretty circular looking structure. And in fact, that's his, uh, that's a pseudoaneurysm that his uh, superior gluteal artery is roughly, the, you know, bigger than your pinky. Uh, 
Um, and sure enough, when we took him into the OR, we got into it uh, pretty quick. I've, I've never really seen anybody bleed that much. And he had to go to the angio suite uh, straight away. I had to pack him and then come back for another day. Uh, but then, you know, back in the OR, he gets re resuscitated, stabilized, and then we're back to the same thing. We, we need to make sure that we understand uh, the GJ views because that's what you're going to be going off of in the OR. Um, for him, we got the relatively simple transverse clamp pretty well through the notch. Uh, we used an anterior column screw across the anterior portion of the transverse. Again, it's really critical that you understand what you're looking at on these Jude views, and you can't just uh, blow through them. You have to really understand what you're looking at. Once we've set the anterior column, then we're looking at the posterior column, getting that clamp with a fair book and uh, smashed up at that point. The superior gluteal bundle is pretty well coiled off. You can see all the fiber and glue that's clogged up in there. And uh, at that point, thankfully, uh, once we pulled out all the packs and we didn't have any additional bleeding for this uh, gentleman. Uh, and then what went on from there. Same thing, we're sort of assessing the reduction as we go along. We've restored a congruent joint. Um, and then uh, lateral plate went on first for me, then immediate plate to sort of reinforce the column fixation. And then uh, here's our final views. You can see on the Judays, I didn't get the contour quite right for that lateral plate. It's sitting up a little bit off the ilium, but otherwise, um, you know, the, the reduction of the socket was, uh, I think, overall a pretty good repair for him. I don't know if you guys have any other comments before we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to John for the third case. No, I think it's fantastic to see that all the way through. And again, I just think that building up what Will was showing from the start, I mean, I just think it sets you up from the beginning to try to understand the fracture. I mean, I think we kind of go through that case pretty quick. Um, and looking at the names of the people that are here in terms of participants, I think people are getting fairly familiar in terms of being that. But then again, truly understanding your fracture will dictate your approach. Um, and then not relying on all those surface renders you talk about, because I mean, it happens, I'm sure at your guys' institution, you know, for triage or sign out, people will present the AP and they, their, their tendency is to want to skip and go right to the 3D, you know, and it's great maybe for some education and some of that final uh, thoughts, but I think the meat of it is going through those uh, initial views and then uh, getting the axials and all the recons to really get the details that are going to be glossed over on the 3Ds, you know, and so I think it's all those pieces, but we can't skip the, the initial ones, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's see if I can get you a control from you, Steve. And so here we are, this is our third case. I think we're doing pretty good on time. And so here's a, a, a younger patient compared to the first two. This is a 34 year old female, uh, still in a high speed MVC. And here's her injury AP pelvis. And again, it's, it's fairly good quality for a, a recess bay AP pelvis. You can see a lot of contrast in her bladder, not a big bladder shift, but you see a pretty impressive right-sided injury. Um, and so, I think here, I would love to be able to have discussion with some of the participants in terms of what they're thinking. Um, but let me see if I can go through and just think about and annotate some of the things that we're seeing. Or maybe how about Will? What are you seeing on that? All right. So I, I see what looks clearly the ilio um, issue line looks stepped off in the back. I can't tell about the um, uh, ilio pectineal line. It appears though. Uh, the head is dislocated probably with the posterior piece because the anterior piece probably is staying relatively intact there. Um, you know, as I look at a, another view, you pulled it out the length, which is good, um, and got the head back underneath probably that anterior piece. I'm looking down here, it appears the issue of ramus is broken. I get a decent view of the iliac wing. I don't see it broken. So, you know, as I go through my algorithm, it looks like I've got one column um, it's the posterior column. I've got the ilio uh, ramus broken, so it's not just like a wall. This is going to be a posterior column. And if I had a Jude, I'd have more information about the posterior column, but there looks like there's a, a small goal sign there. So, you know, this may be a posterior column, posterior wall, based on what I'm seeing just really with this one radiograph. Yeah, I like that. Any, anything to add first off, Steve, before we get into the other views? Uh, I think you kind of hit everything. I think the the next view is actually where, again, people, you know, in conference or whatever, you, if you don't look at every single radiograph that gets taken, you know, the, the next picture is, you know, look doesn't look so bad, but this gives you a lot more information uh, just on that injury film 
because everything is much more displaced because of that dislocation, you can pick up on where these fracture lines are and you can almost slot this one home as again, a, sort of looks like it's gonna be a posterior column, posterior wall, uh, just based on this single AP pelvis. Yeah, and I think those are great. I mean, going through those other lines, I think we see that the roof is there, you know, that 60 degree arc doesn't look to have any sort of involvement. Um, and then we're looking at kind of the anterior rim. And I wish I could show you my mouse as I'm drawing it, but it uh, doesn't look like there's any involvement there. And then it's hard to judge the, uh, the teardrop. You know, you can see it there, uh, but with a rotated AP pelvis that we're looking at, it's kind of hard to make a side to side comparison. Um, but just like you said, I think it's, um, it's such a good view to have the injury radiograph, just like almost any injury, right? You see the initial vector for displacement. You see the tendency of where the instability is going to push. Because when you get this patient reduced, uh, you can see it's a, it's a much different picture, right? I mean, I think that um, clearing that arrow, you can hardly see any kind of fracture lines. You know, there's, there's variants for sure where people have a, a beak up here on the top where you may not even know that's a posterior wall fracture, but you're thinking about um, yeah, I don't think any columnar involvement, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the slight rotation here on the, on the, what is your reduction AP pelvis makes it hard to see where that column would be. You know, there's a very subtle fracture line, but really, um, man, that's tough to pick up aside from that wall piece now. Yeah, I'm with you. And so I think the, um, just the, the stark difference between those two, and again, I think this is, you know, when you, look, you talk about textbook, I mean, when you have posterior column involvement, this is the picture I think about, you know, in terms of that large spike with the head following the caudal segment. I think that's the thing that I, at least in my brain, that's, that's the picture that I'm trying to explain when I'm telling people what a posterior column or a posterior column, posterior wall uh, fracture is. And I think just like Will was saying, I think the, the hallmark is the intact uh, iliopectineal line. Um, and again, it's purely a one column. And so I don't need to go down that big algorithm because I think that, oh shoot, I only have one column involved now. I know it's the posterior column. I see a fracture of the posterior wall. And I think Steve, you nailed it in about two seconds that this is the diagnosis. And so now we just go through and I think, you know, we know the diagnosis. We're already thinking about how our approach is. Let's go digging through some of the other details. Think about what we're going to see in our due days, confirm our diagnosis, pick up some of those subtle things. Um, and then start planning our, our operation. And so if we start going through, um, there's our reduction. Here's our first iliac oblique of the right. Um, and I think we're gonna put them side by side in just a second so you can see it, but just take 10, 15 seconds. And Will, does that add anything for you compared to what you were thinking from the AP pelvis? It confirms what I think we already knew from the injury film. And if you only saw the the reduced film because your resident didn't want to show you the the dislocated film, um, you you now know exactly kind of at least what's going on along the posterior column. Yeah, and I'll come back to it, but I think it's always great to see the fracture lines that you're seeing, and then you're going to realize, you know, if you were doing some approach, your anticipated cortical reads that you'll get from the surface rendered, but you'll see the difference. I think for the participant side to side of where the the cortex is and where the fracture line is going doesn't always add up. And so if we go to the obturator now, Steve, anything different that adds to our discussion from the AP pelvis? Either no, really, I mean, or reduced? Again, confirming your anterior column is probably intact. The posterior wall is moderately displaced, uh, moderately sized, nothing crazy. It's not flipped up upside down and maybe spiking the nerve or anything crazy like that. But this is, again, kind of lining up with exactly what we picked what it was going to look like based on your AP pelvis. Yeah, yeah if, the, if the ring wasn't broken, which you can actually see that it is here, but if the or I say the ring, the obturator ring, the ischial ramus right there, yeah. Um, you might be tempted on that oblique uh, to say, oh, that's a transverse comes across as a transverse posterior wall. But it, clearly here, the anterior column is not broken. That fracture plane does not come across into the iliopectineal line there along the anterior column. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, this is a posterior column. The posterior wall. Foley in the interim. And so now let's just go back. Here's some very select axial CT images. There are no surprises. So there's no, I mean, we look for the impaction, we look for all that list of things that Steve put up. 
um, every single time. But again, just the highlights of some of those different fracture lines. And we'll go back and see them. And just like Will pointed out, we're kind of getting that low uh, exit point of the ischium, not a classic exit point right in the middle of the obturator foramen, but you're kind of seeing it a little more posterior. Um, and then let's go to here, just side by side. And again, not much to see on the AP pelvis. I think you are starting to see some of those subtleties of the fracture going down that posterior aspect of the ischium on both sides. And once you see it, now your eye kind of goes back and forth uh, from side to side, you can see it. And same thing with that posterior wall, just a little bit different from side to side with a good AP pelvis, which we don't have, but um, with the, the, the surface render, you can see the difference. And then side to side for the iliac oblique, you can see here. And I think just the point I was trying to make is that here's the cortical read um, on the 3D surface rendered. And you can see how that fracture line comes down. That's not where the fracture line enters the articular surface. And same thing over here. You see on the on the iliac oblique radiograph, you see the fracture yeah. line within that the cortex comes down, you know, into the uh, quadrilateral plate and working anteriorly. But the articular fracture comes kind of straight through into the dome, just like we saw in the AP pelvis. And so again, creating that 3D map of what we're thinking about and how that's going to correlate with what we see. We can't just rely on the surface rendered. And so again, I think we're always thinking about that um, and just another great example of why. Same thing here, side by side, very similar views, just showing the, the intact anterior column, the posterior wall. We're gonna look up the size and fragmentation and other things like cortical impaction, all the stuff we're looking at, we're looking for, we're gonna see, but very simple. And then again, just the beauty, I think it puts together. And Steve, you showed the nice slide about now where we're thinking about clamps how we're going to do this fracture, what's the maneuvers we're going to go, what's our algorithm for that. And so just some very generic thoughts about, you mentioned a, you know, a, a goose clamp with the notch, which I think is a very standard move for a lot of these fractures. Um, you can do a young bluth, you can do small modified uh, point to points. Um, and here's just some select intraoperative um, images from that patient utilizing some of those techniques. Um, very similar uh, clamp placement uh, as you had initially just a little more posterior, but for that vector that we were thinking about on this view, you know, where does that fracture need to be and when and how am I gonna put the wall down? And so again, just all the thoughts we come through, but knowing um, how to appreciate that fracture from the start um, will get you kind of to here. And so just like uh, you were showing for two column or two plates, I think for stability wise, uh, one for the wall out wide and also helping uh, fortify the, the column, but then a main, more medial column reduction with some independent screws for both the wall and the column. But uh, again, just two good examples, or I think one example uh, of just something a little bit uh, less typical, um, but a, a pretty interesting fracture to talk about. Yeah. All right, great. I think we're doing pretty good on time. We're gonna, gonna take the screen back over here. Perfect. Um, if y'all wouldn't mind, uh, we're going to go back over if the participants, we're going to sort of revisit, see what we've learned today, see if we can improve our scores a little bit as we go along. So this is back to case one of the rapid fire review. Let's revisit this. Here's your three views, your AP and then your Judeo obliques. We're going to try and slot this into the late Janelle classification. And uh, there we go, Mackenzie, perfect. Good. Yeah. So that I think we've we've all honed in on it. I think that this improves a little bit on what the the pre-test was. I think we had eighty percent um, pick posterior wall in the pre-test, but this is exactly what we see. Uh, any comments from the other faculty? This one's a pretty much a chip shot, if you don't mind me um, saying so. Yeah. No. I think it is. I think uh, you've got your uh, ghost rendered uh, views there that show um, uh, no fracture of the the posterior or anterior column, you've got the big goal sign. You know, if you were to follow the algorithm, the answer there is you, you've got a posterior wall fracture. Yep. And do we have uh, some uh, post, uh, post results here? Yeah, post results, um, uh, we got 100% uh, answer posterior wall. I don't know if any, everyone could see that or not, uh, Mackenzie, but uh, I, I did. All right. There's your post uh, reduction films. We'll move on to rapid fire case two, revisit this one as well. <laughs> 
Here's your three views. And this had some controversy. I like yeah. it. This was 50-50 yeah. the pretest. Only one person has answered. Oh, there we go. That means our fellows are sleeping. Wake up. Yeah. Well, it's anonymous. <laughs> come after you. Hey, um, I do, do you have you don't have the Judays by themselves in another slide? I don't think you do. I think you did initially. Right. But not here. No, not at the end. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of controversy still. I think that. This is partially uh, a, a bit of uh, poor question making on my part. In full disclosure, I haven't had a great. Uh, this is, I guess, I guess, I don't know what the other faculty think. I, I would say that there there are components of a T type here, um, but in in terms of actually treating the fracture, may not be particularly relevant. Um, and I almost treated it more like a transverse. I don't know what what you guys think when you look at this, but uh, that quadrilateral plate fracture is incomplete it doesn't even really exit out at the inferior ramus there and you can so see i the, that's why i was asking about that film i i actually thought when i looked at these pre-tests that i saw down there on the um obturator oblique a fracture through that ramus um if i remember correctly i just I, i'm not seeing it on that small yeah, film. It, it's not i this is one that i went over uh quite a bit pre-operatively and decided that I could do all of this from the back because it looked like, as far as I could tell, there wasn't a displaced fracture at the inferior ramus. Um, and I was gonna approach this entirely with a Coker Langebeck from the back, clamp it like it was just a transverse and it, it behaved pretty well. Um, John, you have any other thoughts? This is sort of what I did uh, in the OR. No, this is like the, you know, thank God. It, it, I think it, by definition, you can see the split, right? Between the columns, but it's, yeah. not, in, it's not fully complete. Um, down by the ischium and that's like a great because I mean I think we all know how difficult T's can be in terms of what their personality and displacement is but if it's going to act like a transverse which it sounds like it did and looks like it did with one single clamp you know one shot one kill that's a great thing but I think understanding where that split is where's the clamp going to go kind of what's the next steps once you get your anterior clamp on maybe it doesn't fully act you're going to need something to augment your posterior column I think, again, that's the key part of, of understanding the fracture. And so I think I agree with both you guys. It's it's by definition a T, but it's kind of a wannabe. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah. So go back to the other view. And, and so when you look at your day views, and again, this is why it's kind of important. You really get a great idea of where the money is, right? The money's in the back, right? The front isn't displaced hardly at all. And so, you know, you really don't have to do much work up there. Yep. Um, and so this is one that, you know, if you recognize it's a T um, or you think it's just a transverse, you realize you can get this from the back because you can do all the work there that needs to be done. And you don't have to really do anything up front other than stabilize it. Right. And so, um, uh, it, it, again, you know, just knowing, you know, how you get to your answer it, uh, of what the classification is also gives you where you got to do the work. Right? right. And and this is one that, you know, all the all the work is going to be done in the back. So that's where you're going to go. And so it's helping you dictate, you know, how you're going to fix it. Yeah. Perfect. And I think real quick, just I mean, for some of the participants, just to kind of what were they thinking? I think for the posterior wall, maybe on the oblique view, you can see as you're looking through the, the fracture pattern, if you go back one slide, Steve, I mean, you're seeing some comminution there on the iliac oblique that maybe some part of a posterior wall comminution. And so it's a little bit tricky. And I, I think we'd rely heavily on the CT scan, but looking at the obturator, you see a, a large chunk of the wall uh, is not really involved at all. And so again, it's not a hundred percent accurate because you can't really fully see the, the full arc, but uh, I'm wondering if that's what some of the participants were thinking in terms of making that diagnosis for the transverse posterior wall. Yep. Good pick up. All right, this is moving on to case three. Here's your three views. 
a bit of a smattering again. Mackenzie, are you showing that to everybody? Yes, everybody can see it. Okay. Yeah, so talk us through this one, John. Yeah, I think this is great. I mean, this is some of the beauty and benefit. This is an elder uh, who was riding his bike and uh, he landed just like you said. And so I think um, looking at this, you can see clear disruption of the iliopectineal line. Um, I can't control the screen, but you can see the disruption there at the pelvic rim up anteriorly. And then I'm seeing a fracture line that's going up the crest. You can see that on the AP, hard to know if that's gas or not, but I can see your mouse going up there. And then for sure on the iliac oblique, you can see that. Um, and then we're, we're going down the pattern of, is this going to be two columns involved in terms of two lines disrupted? Um, again, on a good AP pelvis, which I think we have, um, there's not much uh, discrepancy between the two ilio um, ischial lines. And again, that's pretty clear. Although that iliac oblique isn't quite rotated, you know, 45 degrees, uh, I'm not really seeing a big disruption going anywhere towards the notch. And then so for me, it's only a, a one column, one line fracture that's involved. And so uh, by definition, it's, it's going up to the A that, that we see there. And so um, I think a lot of the points um, will distinguish that between the transverse family. I mean, again, uh, maybe we weren't clear enough, but anytime for me, at least that big branch point in my algorithm, is there any sort of crest involvement? And yeah, I get there's very low anterior columns and stuff, but common things being common, Anytime there's a crest, I just, I forget about the transverse diagnosis. And so transverse and transverse wall and T and T posterior wall aren't even in discussion. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah I would agree. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when you, when you see that anterior column, you're really uh, uh, going way up into the wing like that. You're thinking, you know, anterior column, anterior posterior hemi T and a both column. That's really kind of your, your key. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, you know, this is, this is not a very common fracture. I mean, to see an isolated anterior column, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the most common thing you see out there. Yeah, and what's interesting is that John and I both had very, essentially submitted the same case. Um, <laughs> so it's like essentially the same exact pattern where the inferior ring isn't really disrupted as far as we can tell. Um, but the, almost the entirety of the weight-bearing dome is up on that iliac uh, wing piece. Um, and I think by that definition, you have to classify it as an anterior column pattern. I think you can kind of see that just like that T, there's a little bit of a bend. On, you know, you can scrutinize, yeah. you can see it there on the object. Yeah. You kind of see a slight bend, you know, and it's just kind of like almost plastic deformation. There's a, there's a mobile segment there. And so, again, not like the classic hallmark thing that you're going to see. But again, you see a, a clean quadrilateral plate and really no posterior column involvement at all. You know, one of the things that I think when people jump to these um, 3D images is this is basically taking the axial data that's the true data and then reformatting it, right? And so sometimes when there's little gaps in there, I mean, especially, you know, when the thinnest CT cuts we used to get were two millimeters, right? Now it's, you know, 0.6 or, or, or whatever, but when it, it used to have a little bit bigger gap, sometimes you'd miss things on those, those reformats of, you know, the, the um, coronals or the sagittals or the 3D cuts and you'd miss some things. So, you know, really go back and look at those axial CT cuts because that's your, your real data. Yeah, it really depends on the, the pack system and the smoothing algorithm that you're taking with that 3D rendered image. You can miss a lot of stuff on, uh, on some of these images. So anterior column though, that's gotta be addressed from the front. Got some version of an other angle, I would suppose, uh, John. Sure did. Yeah. Looks really good. All right, we'll move on. I think we've got a lot of follow-up for this patient. I'm not sure if I have two-year follow-up on just about anybody. Um, this is the rarity, right? It's a unicorn. All right, we'll move on to case four. Bring up the quiz again. Let's see where we're at. Hopefully we didn't mess anyone up on this one. <laughs> You look at the pretest results. Yeah. <laughs> it can only go downhill. <laughs> I think we've confused some people. How do we, how do we manage to do that? What are you guys seeing on this? Um, I, I see one thing on the operator oblique. It's, it's a bit of a giveaway. Again, kind of jumping the, 
you know, jumping the gun a bit, but this is like one of those one picture images that you can almost make the diagnosis. And then, I mean, you got to go back and correlate it on, on everything else. But, you know, for me, you see the iliopectineal, the iliacial lines are disrupted on that AP pelvis. The dome's not in the right spot. The head looks like it's medialized. Um, you know, there's a, you know, fractional lines heading up into the crest. You know, everything about this is, uh, like Route says, it's like Ant Mini. This looks like a bolt column to me. And then just confirm that on the, on the Jude oblique or the, the volume rendered images. You guys have any other thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I mean, so if, if you follow the case that I did and you walk yourself down through that same algorithm, you get to that final question is, is there a spur sign or is there not? Because the anterior column, posterior hemi T and both column are similar. It just depends on whether or not there's any acetabulum left to the SI joint. And sometimes that's hard to tell on the, um, uh, on the radiographs unless you see the spur sign. And where you see that arrow there, that's the spur sign. That's the ilium, and there's no there's no acetabulum left. All yeah. of it went with the joint, and it's all medialized. You won't get that medialization uh, like that uh, unless you've got um, the acetabulum completely disassociated from the ilium. Yeah, here's a couple couple of extra surface rendered images. This this one's a tough one for me to deal with. You know, how are you going to deal with the extra combination along the wall at the posterior column? Does that need a a separate approach posteriorly. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be said. You can have an entire series of webinars on how you deal with both columns. Um, and with this this one, like most both columns, you're starting in the front and then figuring out whether or not you need to go from the back um, for me. Um, good. We're just about out of time. We'll go ahead and move on to the fifth and final rapid fire. Oh, spot on. Five out of five. Uh, nicely done. Yeah, I think again, I mean, this is like a very subtle fracture line. Um, just like almost on that reduced one that we, we talked about for the case three, you know, you see a little bit of disruption, hard to maybe differentiate. Is it the very posterior part of the iliopecneal or is it the caudal part of the iliacial? And um, I think once you start looking at the iliac obliques, you can kind of differentiate that. Um, and then you'll see just very similar. It's just one line and then there's no posterior wall. And so before you see any other views or CT, I think it's uh, it's pretty clear. It's just an isolated posterior column. Not very displaced, you know, like the initial one, and that's the classic. But again, uh, as you spin it around and see, you'll appreciate um, that's just a, a true isolated posterior column with very similar incomplete going down into the ramus. It's there. Um, it's fudged out by the, by the surface rendering. But again, that hinge point's there. Yep. All right. So... Uh... Just, just about on time here. Uh, we'll move on to the final take home messages. Thank you everyone for uh, being here this evening. Thank you very much for faculty and especially to Mackenzie uh, and uh, Abby and the rest of the staff at the AO. Um, but the uh, take home messages for us this evening are that it's really critical that you understand the plane radiographs and how you are able to classify and then subsequently treat these acetabular fractures. The extra information that you get from the CT scans, that's going to help you finalize the finer details of your operative plan. And then making sure that you can understand the intraoperative and your preoperative images, that makes sure that you can uh, have an excellent uh, reduction in fixation for your uh, fractures and for your patients. So unless there's any other questions or, or comments, uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening.